I had what probably could have been five or six talks to give during this weekend, but I only had so much time, so I gave one of the talks already, and this is going to be about two and a half of the talk ideas combined into one. So this will be a long one. Hope you have your caffeine to stay awake. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you know, preserving uh, books, mostly technical books, and the various processes we have to go through. As some of you know, books don't last forever. They start degrading over time. They might yellow. Uh, people die and leave behind their collection, which then is not valued by their heirs and gets thrown out. Uh, these books, when you have a printed book, you can't search them, which is, to me, the biggest problem with a printed book. You can't have, it with, can't have it with you all the time. You have your smartphone with you, but you can't have a whole stack of manuals. And books go to print, and then there is no way to obtain them again. So yeah, but keep in mind, books have existed 2,000 years. Right. <laughs> At least the concept and, of writing, you know. <laughs> and actually, printed books stick around faster, than the, stick, along, stick around longer than a particular digital format, too, which Exactly. Yeah. Electronic form of CDs, DVDs, thumb drives, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. So the solution to those problems I mentioned, which creates the new issue of formats changing, is that a digital copy is a digital copy, which will stay around forever as long as you update it for whatever the new media storage technologies are or data format storage. And one problem, though, is a lot of books don't have a digital edition. They were created before computers did publishing, and they never had an electronic copy, even if you could talk to the original publisher to try to get one. So these books all must be scanned to have a digital copy. Uh, now, how do you do that? Well, it depends on the book and what your goals are for the scan. I see there as being two separate approaches to digitizing a book. I call them the historian approach and the engineer approach. The historian approach is where you're trying to preserve the original appearance of the book, the texture of the ink, the texture of the paper. The people who actually want to be able to smell a book, they can maybe smell it by seeing the leather bound binding or whatever. It's basically going to be a photograph. The, that shows what the book was if you want a historic record of it, but it's really not as useful if it's something you want to use every day in, as a reference as a preference. Uh, ink that may be black is now a dark gray. Paper that that should be white might just be a light gray. Colors are not going to be as vibrant. And also, unless you're using lossy compression with a large compression ratio, these files are going to be huge and not as easy to store on your mobile device or download off the internet or whatever. The other approach, the engineer approach that I like, is where you attempt to make PDF that looks like what would have been the original document to print the book. So uh, pretending like the original book had been made on a computer, try to make it look like the document that was printed to make that book. Like a PDF of a Word, Word document, so it doesn't look like a scan. It just looks like a, an original digital copy. Black is black, white is white, colors are bright. And this results in much smaller files, and there are techniques we can use to optimize them to make them even smaller than you might otherwise. So here's an example. This is a scan from a page of a manual, the, what I call the historian approach, which is really just, it's just a raw scan. I've done nothing to this. We go to the next one, you can see this. This is my engineer approach. The background, it's hard to tell on the projector, but I'll go between the two of these, see if I can make this work. Yeah. So you can see the background's a little brighter, colors are a little bit more vibrant, the yeah. text is a little darker. And that file, and the edges are straight and right to the edge of the page. And that file is significantly smaller than the mm -hmm. first file. So I'm an engineer. I don't care about the smell of the book. I want something that I can read and use if it's a calculator I need reference for. And as I said, the raw scan of the scan, scanner is the closest I'm getting to a historian approach. To my take my to get my output, there are multiple steps which I will talk. How do we get the scan? Well, there are really three main ways that you can scan these books. One is that you leave the book intact, you take a flatbed scanner, open the book to the page, hold the book down, scan it, and repeat. This is going to take probably a minute per page to do it. 
Another one, this is used by museums with very priceless historic books, is they set up a jig that holds the book open with a camera and they photograph each of the pages so they don't have to open it up too far and maybe damage the binding. The third approach is where you dis disassemble the book, and sometimes this is somewhat destructive of the book if the binding has to be cut off, and use an automatic document feeder. And that way you can just zoom through them a few seconds a page, much quicker. So I flat not, yeah, I'm trying to address the uh, Richard Nelson, Bob Prosperity differences. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some people who care about preserving the book for the future value, and some who don't. And that can determine which of these approaches works best. So for flatbed scanning, flatbed scanners do provide the best quality results. When I compare them to the ADF, it's a sharper scan, higher resolution. It, it's going to give you the best, best quality scan. And the book can remain intact as well. You don't have to worry about the binding. But it's very time consuming. It takes like a minute or so per page. You have to line the page just right and go on to the next one. And one difficulty is that if you don't unbind the book, then close to the spine of the book, you may get some blurring or distortion, that kind of thing. So even if you're using a flatbed, it can be advantageous to remove the binding first. I have found that um, there are two main classifications of flatbed scanners, the CIS and CCD ones, and I've found the CCD ones are a little more forgiving about focus. The CIS ones are faster and cheaper, and mine is actually a CIS one. I, I do, for a lot of purposes, I like CIS better, but it, you have to have it right on the glass or it can get blurry. Is there any software that compensates for that, that curvature in the spine? You could, the problem is that depending on how thick the book is and how hard you press down, it's going to be different, so you'd have to uh, recalculate for every single page. Maybe there's automated software that analyzes and tries to do that. I don't know. Okay. I've not encountered that. Right. The next approach, a camera, here's, here's just a stock photograph of one jig that one company uses for scanning books. And it can provide very good results. If you have a camera of, say, 34 megapixels, that's equivalent to a 600 DPI scan of an 8.5 by 11 page. And, the uh, higher end uh, D DSLRs and mirrorless cameras are in that megapixel range. You have to be very careful with lighting to make sure you don't have any shadows or uneven lighting. And you can see there they've got two large, two large lights at different angles. Uh, one manual that I have on my site was a French version of the HP 65 manual. And the person there had attempted something similar to this. I think they just used a smartphone camera or something like that. And their lighting wasn't anything special, but it actually worked. It sure wasn't ideal, but it provided an image that with some manual cleanup effort was perfectly readable. Last approach, this is the one I take, and that's the exact scanner that I use, is an ADF, automatic document feeder. You can put in like 100 plus sheets at a time. It can do five, 10 pages a minute, 600 DPI color. A lot of the ADFs are only 300, but I made sure to get one that's 600 DPI. But it has some disadvantages. As I said, it's not as sharp as a flatbed scan. And there's a streaking issue where if a piece of dust gets on there, now it makes a line all the way down your page. Whereas with a flatbed scan, a piece of dust is just one speck. So you have to be careful to keep, make it clean. So use a microfiber cloth or something, a lint-free cloth. I do it after every book, and if I look through and there's a piece of dust on there, I wipe it off in the middle. Yes. What if it misfeeds? So you got 100 pages and number yeah. 17 misfeeds and... Yeah, I've been very happy with this scanner that it does a good job of not misfeeding, but there are occasionally the times... Huh? Yeah, yeah. FI-7160, I believe. Is this the, make, these make Fujitsu scanners are incredible, Richard. Yeah. Tens of thousands of pages with a lot of misfeed. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. Now, they make a faster version of this, 7180, and then they have a wide format version. I can't remember the model number on that. It's like 2000 something dollars, so it's a few times the price. But they're not cheap, but they work very well. I've been very happy with this Fujitsu. And uh, as I said, the quality isn't quite as good as a flatbed, but it's good enough for what we're doing here. The only issue I've had with misfeeds is that two pages are kind of stuck together. Sometimes this might be a little bit of glue. Then sometimes it'll feed the two together at once, which is an ideal situation. Then I just have to go back and scan the middle pages. Or in a less ideal situation, it starts to feed one, not the other, and maybe you could potentially tear. Or really, normally, it's going to just crease the page a bit. But worst case, it could cause a tear on the paper. So you do have to be a little careful. I don't like doing it un unattended for that purpose, but for that reason. But I've found it works, works very well. 
Are you creating one complete document and you scan it? No. No. Because that then I'd have to split it apart to manipulate it. Yes. So each type of book has a different binding. We're going to talk about how we deal with them. So the good thing is that most of the technical books, you can easily unbind them without causing any real damage, any noticeable damage. Uh, if you're talking about novels or whatever, usually there, there's no hope because they're usually hard bound or, bound or perfect binding, or some, some kind which is not going to be easy to scan. But our technical manuals, they're frequently spiral bound, comb bound, wire bound, that kind of thing. And some of these bindings are easier to work with than others, but I have solutions for all of them. So, and even if you do have to destroy the binding to take it apart, there are ways you can put the book back together and still have it be as good, and in some cases better than the original, depending on your views. The six main types of bindings that I've encountered in the books I've been scanning are the spiral binding, which could be plastic or metal coils, plastic comb binding, also known as GBC, which I think is the company that invented them, a twin loop or double loop wire binding, uh, staple binding, three hole binding, which could be not even bound, they're just three holes that are punched, and then a perfect binding, which is typically sewn or glued and could have a hard cover or soft cover. You could add that type that we talked about. I sent you one that had the plastic strips and all the. Yeah, I never encountered that before. <laughs> that, that, that I received that from you I just a couple use days before. I, I had not updated the presentation, I'd never seen one of those before. There you go. <laughs> But spiral bindings are my favorite kind of binding because it can lie flat on the desk, so you have it open to a certain page. You can go a full 360 degrees around. And they can be metal, like your notebook bindings or plastic. The holes can be either round or oval. Oval holes I prefer because it's easier to ins insert the coil than the round holes. But usually the professional ones are round because they just drilled them. The, the oval ones are punched. Uh, Disadvantage of the metal binding coils is they're prone to paint chipping off them, which makes them look unsightly, but even worse, they can get crushed. And they go out around then, and then it doesn't open and close as easily, and it just looks bad. And unfortunately, there's once it's been crushed, it's pretty much impossible to try to fix that. So you have to be careful with the, with the wire, with the metal coils. Plastic coils don't have that problem, they just bounce right back into place. That's why I like the plastic ones. You can easily take them out and put them back in again. After enough times of uncrimping and uncrimping the end, it'll weaken it, but it still it can still get a bunch of bindings and unbindings out of the book. HP used the metal spiral bindings in many of the manuals in the 80s. Here's an example of the 41C Aviation Pack. You can see that the metal, a metal coil on the side, and it opens up nice and flat. Here's a close-up of the crimped end of it that mm -hmm. holds it together. How you bind a spiral-bound book, first you need a way to put the holes in the pages, and typically of something like this, this is the exact one machine I have. I use this one for coil-binding books, either ones that I disassemble or just new books. And usually you can do about a dozen pages at a time, and then you punch the next dozen and so on until you have the whole book punched. And it's time consuming, takes takes a lot of work. And these machines are still not cheap. They're, I think this one was probably close to $400. And uh, the, I'm guessing the commercial printing press type systems probably have some kind of fancy drill system, but I have not found any pricing on them. I don't know anything about them other than I'm sure they cost a whole lot. So once you drill the holes, then you, or punch the holes, you put the coil in. You can either use an electronic coil inserter, which is really just a, a rubber, like a rolling pin, rubber, rubber pin that just spins and you hold it up to it and just go zoop, and it zooms, it zooms it right on. And I have one of those too, but honestly, I'm not sure if it's worth it because you have to get it just right. And yes, it saves some time if you're doing a bunch, but usually it's not really worth it. Once it's on there, you can crimp the end, either just use the pliers, or I've got a special crimping tool that works pretty well. One thing I found, once you trim the end off the coil, because these coils come in 12 inch lengths, and your books might be 11 inches or 8 inches or whatever, you've got excess coil. They make a really good cat toy. So if you have cats, remember some of those cats, save those, those, and cats love them. That's what the crimping tool looks like, that's what the coil looks like, and that just explains it. So the, Coils, I have between 6 millimeters and 45 millimeter diameters for different sizes of books. I really don't recommend anything over 30 millimeters, and the reason is the bigger it gets, the more it sticks off the edge of the book, 
and just kind of gets in the way. So for things over 45 millimeters, maybe GBC is, is a little easier to work with. Sorry, things over 30 millimeters, maybe GBC is a little bit easier to work with. Plastic home binding is the next kind. It, it opens flat. It doesn't quite go the full 360. It comes close, though. It's pretty durable. The only problem I found, especially with some of these older books that Rich, Richard has sent me, is that some of those plastic fingers, you call them, tend to break as the plastic gets old and brittle. And it just doesn't seem quite as durable as the, as the coil bindings. But you have rectangular holes that are punched into the paper. You can pretty easily take them apart and put them back together again, even sometimes accidentally. Yeah, I don't know how many of you have had these, these comb-bound books that sometimes pages start falling off the back. So you have to put them back in again. It's easiest to insert them with a special machine, but you can put these bindings on by hand, too. The machine opens it up, just does it in one go by hand, you can, you can put them on in. A lot of the third-party calculator books I've found use this kind of binding. A lot of small print shops and offices have the equipment to do it. Here's an example of one of those. Again, you can see the, the straight line down the left with all the fingers in it, and uh, it lies flat. Here's a close-up of what it looks like. You can see there the fingers go inside. You can, they may go outside, but you can just flip them back in. If you look at this right here, the finger goes down, comes in here, but sometimes it comes up around the outside, and you just have to fix that if it comes loose like that. This is an example of a comb binding machine. I don't have one, but it was just a picture I found on the internet. It's similar cost and similar difficulty for the punching of a coil binding. The way, the way you bind and unbind these by hand is I just start in one end and I pull up each one of those fingers to loosen it and then pull it out through the pages and that releases it and just work your way all the way down. Once they're all removed, the pages are free and you can scan them. And when you re need to rebind again by hand, you can do it just the opposite direction, put one finger in at a time. I found that it's a little tricky, especially for the first few of the pages might start to get misaligned and then it won't go through. So you have to hold it just right. Yeah. Then you can get them in. If you're not careful and taking it apart, you can crinkle the paper and then it won't yeah. read the scanner. <laughs> right, right. That too, yeah. But here's an example where I started taking a few of them off. Wire binding. Uh, so this is basically as good as a spiral binding from a usability perspective, but I think it's a lot easier to have a machine off that automates the insertion of it because it's more reliable to have a, a, a twin wire thing that just closes down on it than to try to screw in the coil. So you see this with professional, professionally bound manuals, like the HP manuals that were common in the 70s and into the 80s. Uh, it has the same disadvantage of the metal spiral bindings, that it can get crushed, and then it, it just becomes a mess, and you can't uncrush a crushed metal wire binding. It uses rectangular holes, usually that look like the ones from the cone binding, but I have seen round on the occasional one. Question. Yes. Do you know if HP actually manufactured their own books and bindings, or did they farm it out to a book binding company? Richard's not even yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the third party companies have done it. Sometimes in entire, entirely different places. A lot were printed in Singapore, even when the calculators were still made in the US, too. And here's an example of wire bound 41 pack. You can see it looks like twin loops in each one, but they're it's really a single, a single wire going all the way up that goes in and around. And kind of like a U-shaped wire that's been bent around, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And here's a close-up of where they meet. They always meet inside the back cover, and I'm assuming that's for durability reasons. Now, uh, uh, so the pages are less likely to fall out. Now, which, which one they do, if the, if the big loop is on the back cover or the small loop is in the back cover, that ranges. There's not consistency even among the same set of manuals. So it seems like they don't necessarily take much care into which to do. I can see arguments for which is more durable than the other. I'm not sure which is actually better. Uh, I lean towards thinking that it's better to have the big loop on the non-back cover side, but I don't have enough experience to say which is actually better. Now, uh, to do a wire-bound book again, to bind it's very similar to the last couple types. You need to have a machine that punches the holes, just like for coil or comb binding. But then you also need a special machine that closes that what the wires together. You can't really do it by hand. I've, I've never tried totally. I've got a technique that I'll show you though. 
And everyone online that I've seen says that these wire bindings are one-time use. You cannot take them apart and reuse them again. That's not entirely true. With some experimentation, I've found a way to do it. But there's one special tool you need that you don't necessarily have. And that is fingernails that have been growing for at least a week, maybe two. <laughs> so they can get long enough to get your fingernails right in there. So you need to let your fingernails grow out a bit. And then you've got a perfect tool that doesn't damage the paint on, on the wire, but can still get in there into tight places and provide enough leverage to pull it, pull it up back. So what you do is you open the book, the inside back cover, where the twin loops meet, and you use two fingernails on two of the wide loops, and then pull just a little bit, and then stick a third fingernail or thumbnail to the narrow one, and then just pull. See, it, it's a really tiny area, so your fingernails have to be just long enough to get in there. The two there, and then pull just a little bit, maybe a mill millimeter or two is all. If you pull it too open too far, it's going to deform the wire, and it won't look good when you put it back together but don't pull it open enough and you won't be able to get the page out. So just make it big enough to get a small number of pages, maybe five sheets of paper out at a time, and repeat for each one of those loops until you've got it. It may take a couple minutes to do it. Then once you've got them all unbent, you can remove the pages a few at a time until they're all out. And the order depends. Because some, if, if, it's, if it's oriented one way, you take the Back cover up, the back cover off, then the front cover, then all the pages. Sometimes you take all the pages and then the front cover, and then the back cover. It depends on which order they put the put them into them. Once you scanned all your pages, you put them back in by the, just the opposite of the way you took them out. You put a few pages in at a time, either starting with the beginning, the back cover, or the end of the book, depending on the order you want to do it in. And I found, especially for the first few time, first few pages, it can be tricky because this coil tends to, that coil, this wire binding tends to curl up and not be straight, and you have to get it in there just right and make sure no pages fall out. And just repeat until all of them are there, but the farther you get along, it's easier to do. Then just very carefully squeeze those loops together with your fingers, and it'll look pretty much exactly the way it was before you started. I have a vid couple of videos here that I made. This is a video of me pulling it open. So if you look, I stick two fingers in there, a thumb, and then I just pull a couple millimeters, a few millimeters. And I repeat, the same mm. thing, make, make it so it's an opening of just a couple millimeters. So here? Yeah. We've got a GBC machine in our office that uses wire loops just like this. Mm -hmm. And it's got a jig in it. When you pull the lever, it'll expand that wire loop out mm -hmm. automatically. Oh, wow. So all of it's pulled out and you just release. Okay. Or you can load the document in that way or release it. Mm. And then it's got another section where you push the wire loop back in and it crushes it so it evenly closes all the wires. Nice. Yeah, people online say that you, you can't take it apart, so I guess that's yeah, proof that there are tools there are tools mm -hmm. to do that. The one thing though is that there's so many different sizes of these wire of these wire bindings with different uh, get different uh, what's the term, gauges or what you want to call it, right. that you probably need to have the right machine for each kind of book you want to do. So if you have 20 different shapes in the different books mm -hmm. you want to scan, you'd need all these different machines to handle it. I had a good once, and I had a much easier method. Oh. I used a fat pen. Oh, and just kind of pulled it? Just, no, no, I oh. just pushed the pen yeah. through the, the, the oh. middle of the thing, and it just expands them all. That's another good idea. So do that. Oh, I mean, you you probably do that with like, this uh, so, um, yeah, this is so funny. These everyone lines says you can't do it. You, all you got yeah, all these different phrases. Yeah, dowels. Yeah, dowels. Yeah. 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 Okay. The battery's blinking, but it looks like it stopped Started recording. Again. And then change the battery. I was going to do that at the 30 minute mark. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Okay. Then I have a video here showing me. Uh, oh, this is the same video. Let's go back to the next, the next slide. A video here of me putting the pages in. I found a couple techniques. Here's one that I found is probably the quickest way. I don't recommend this on. Wire bindings that have not been painted because then the wire might leave marks in the page, but for painted ones, this is fine. What you do is you just slide the pages in, pick like five or so sheets at a time, start at the end, 
that's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Yeah. So you don't well, go in directly. You right. Can yeah. And then I just yeah. pull it up a little bit until we fall in the holes. Oh. And then oh. turn it over. Oh. And that saves a lot of time over trying to put them in manually. Mm -hmm. Next form of binding is a staple binding. A typical way you have it is it's a small booklet, maybe 20 to 25 sheets of paper maximum, and all you need is a staple with a long neck on it. It just has to reach over the page, you put the stack of pages, staple, and fold it. And the pages all have to be printed in such a way that it's the right order. Otherwise, if you have one, two, three, four on a sheet of paper, it's not going to work if you have 100 pages. You usually have two or three staples, depending on the size of it. And it's, it's pretty easy to unbind because you just pull the staples out. And to rebind, you can use your fingers to push the staples back in. That's what I do. You could re-staple it, but then you're not using the same holes and it doesn't look as good. So I try to reuse the same staples, just bending them by hand and pushing them through the holes. And that works pretty well. So here's an example of a staple-bound book. And then, as I said, the only tool you need is a long neck stapler, like less than 20 bucks. It's not even expensive. To, uh, to unbind a staple bound book, you just open the book to the middle, and then put your fingernail under each leg, pull it up. Now, the person I want to complain about is not here right now, but there's a certain individual who uses some very heavy gauge staples when he's stapling some of these things. And you might destroy your fingernails if you try to pull them up, and you might need something heavier to do the. I found a, a razor blade can go in there to pull it up. Or, at worst case, use a pliers or something, but Pretty much all the books out there, except the ones that Richard has found himself, have staples that you can pull up pretty easily. They're not using construction staples, they're just regular yeah. office staples. Mary? Yes? There's a staple remover. Yes. I know. It's like a, like a spoon mm -hmm. on one end, and then it's got the sharp end on mm -hmm. the other end. Yeah, I've used staple removers. The ones I've used mark the pages a bit. And uh, maybe there exist ones that are more delicate on the paper, but I'm trying to avoid any damage whatsoever to the mm. paper and the staple itself. Yeah. So yes, uh, there are staple removers, but I've not found one that mm. is satisfactory. It's like one of those Chinese spoons. Mm. Metal spoon. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. Very long, very narrow, where you staple it in. Mm -hmm. But I think it would work under the legs of the staple. Okay. Oh, I found it's usually really easy to pull up with my fingernails, so it's not, it's never, I've never wanted a tool for this, but there may be a way to make it a little bit easier. That's good to know that those exist too. Uh, to rebind, that's the, tr that's a little bit trickier because you need to get these little tiny staples through little tiny holes. The first page is easy, that's the cover, you just push the staple in. But for subsequent pages, it's a little bit harder because you've got staples that are about to fall out of loose holes and you're trying to push them into the other pages. And if you have three staples, it's really difficult. Uh, I, if there's three staples, do one the end, then do the middle, then do the next one, repeat for each, for each page. And sometimes I've found if it gets too hard, once you put some pages together, put paper clips to hold them together for the next page so they don't come loose. So we've already done doesn't come loose. You could just restaple it, but then you're going to be using a different staple that won't be won't match the original one, and your holes might not be perfectly aligned. So it depends on how much you care about preserving the original appearance of the book. Here's just an example of a book where there's the staple, and that's where I just pulled it straight. Now you need want them to be perfectly vertical so that they can go into the holes and be aligned right. If you if it's at an angle, you need to bend it out. If it bends the staple, then you need to flatten the staple back with the pliers or something. I use a hammer. Yeah, that would work too. I was just, when you were up, I was just complaining about the staples you use and you can't pull out with your fingers because they're so much. <laughs> uh, that's why I use a pocket knife. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Next type of binding is the three-hole binding. Uh, HP has used this for some, some of their materials. It's just three holes punched in the paper. And you just need a cheap three-hole three punch, less than 10 bucks. And it'll handle, you know, a half inch to a three inch ring binder can do it. You can get folders that have prong fasteners in it. There are other approaches to put them together. I've even seen some that use just 
rings or even zip ties to keep them together. These. Yeah, exactly. They're and, removable and zip ties. And I want to give these to you because the ones I sent you, you, may, you can just cut and then oh, replace them. Yes, the mistake I made, the first ones I cut, but then after that I realized there's a way to take them out without cutting them. So oh, well, them. you can. If yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's, you know, I get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And they're easy to bind and unbind. It's in some ways one of the easiest ways to, ones to work with, but there's one big disadvantage, and that is sometimes these holes are far enough into the page that it's going to interfere with what's printed on the page, and you lose, you lose some of that material. And of course, once it's punched out, you can't get it back. Other big, big disadvantage is sometimes since there are only three holes, pull, only three holes holding it in, that it's a weak point, so the page might tear. You can get little adhesive rings to strengthen those, but it's just another hassle. A couple examples, just some stock photos I found on the internet. There's a D-shaped ring. There are round rings as well. Some rings are on the spine. Some rings are on the back. Different configurations. This has one of the writer folders with prongs. There are also folders with long prongs and slider things. Lots of different configurations you can find to hold these together. How you bind it? Just get a three-hole punch. Few pages at a time, you punch them, you put them all together. So oh, the simple. handle looks better because it's yeah. a punch sticker. Right, right. <laughs> so and you can get single punch ones, but then you have to line them just right. So yeah, at a minimum, get that even better. Get one with the big handles, you can do more pages That's at a time. That's the only way to do it. Right, right. <laughs> to unbind, again, it's trivial. You just open the binding, which could be as simple as pushing levers or unfold some prongs. You scan the pages, put it back together. Last uh, type of binding are Perfect bindings, I call them imperfect bindings, because I don't like them. <laughs> it's common for commercially published books because it makes a really professional looking book, but they're not good for technical manuals because you can't open them flat. They're easy to store and ship because they're just a perfect rectangle and all that in every direction. And printing the spine. Uh, you can print the edge of the spine. Yeah, yeah. There, there, are, there are advantages to them in some ways. The covers can be soft like the HP manuals, or they can be hard, hardboard for hardcover books. They're pretty durable, you can't crush them. You can send them in an envelope and they'll be just and fine. Printing the signatures multiple pages up on a press is also more efficient. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are huge advantages for automation on this and for shipping. For a commercial product, this is the most profitable way to do it. But I don't like mm -hmm. it for technical manuals. And the biggest problem for me is that you can't destructively un I can't undestructively unbind them. Well, and H hold on, HP has used them for most of their manuals since the 80s. For a lot of these reasons, yes. Are, are they using um, Are they using PVA uh, glue to do the binding the I way I do? I don't know what kind of glue they use. I can't tell at this point. Try soap and water next time you have one you're willing well, to use oh, a little damage on. Yeah, right. The problem with water is that soap, the paper soapy wa and water. soap and water. Mm -hmm. Harry, that might be, yes. Uh, mentioning water and books. Mm -hmm. I was just reading somebody was doing some concerns about the library that had water damage. Mm -hmm. They said if you have a book that got water so, put it in the freezer. Oh, okay. And then you can wipe out the water moisture comes out and you just wipe it out. It dehydrates it. Apparently some major libraries have contracted oh. with local freeze dry warehouses hmm. to guarantee themselves a little space at the sprinkler. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I gotta say also, Richard gave a presentation five years ago. Yeah. So on using was it actually Lane's fabric se glue seventeen years ago. Yeah. Uh, one. That, so, no, <laughs> but then one was seventeen years ago, one was seven years ago. Uh, yeah, Eileen's, Richards. Eileen's tacky glue. Yeah. And the last time I went to a fabric store, it, it was too good. They had to discontinue it. But Probably now the same company has easy. like five different glues. Uh, and so I'll have to try i have to try them all to see which one works. <laughs> but those but, 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 flat. Yeah, but that, yeah. That that glue is polyvinyl acetate mm -hmm. and you can you can remove it. You don't have you don't have to totally remove it. Mm -hmm. Just just soak enough get enough soapy water into it to soften it up so you can peel okay. the pages off. Yeah, and then you just rebind it. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to know. So the way a perfect bound book works is you've got signatures, which is what they call a group, so it's pages, typically four to eight sheets of paper that are 16 or 32 pages. They're folded in half like a staple booklet. They sew them together and then they glue them together with the cover on, on the outside. 
I'm not going to go into the details because I hate the bindings. And also <laughs> because Richard Nelson in 2004 gave a presentation on his variation on this where he uses staples and tape rather than sewing and glue. Or 2014, Richard Schwartz gave a presentation on the more traditional approach. Yeah, it's been seven years. So maybe I should wait until HHC 2024 for this presentation for the every 10 year book binding talk. <laughs> if you want to see these presentations, they're on my website. The, 2004 was filmed, was recorded by Jake, 2014 was recorded by me, and also one by Jake on videos.hpcalc.org. And the, the, his videos are on his, his video collection, which you can get the DVDs of. But the tape does come off, I mean, you can yeah. yeah, no, and, and I've done that with some of yours. <laughs> pull the tape off, pull the staples out. Yeah. It's infuriating <laughs> on doing those. Sometimes, but, uh, yeah, but they use stable that's subject to rust. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's yeah. another problem too. Rust, make rust marks on the pages. Yeah, I've, like I've seen rust on some of these. I feel like Richard Forges mm -hmm. re recreation. It's the way I do it, I take the brute force approach. I've got a Martin Yale 7000 knee stack paper cutter. You can cut an inch and a half thick book in one swing. Just stick the book in, slice the binding off, and now I've got a stack of paper that I can stick in the EDF. But yeah. don't send it to bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but then I rebind with a, a coil binding. Spiral binding make it lie flat and easier to read. So now that, for the pager. Yeah, n n n well, this is actually several parts here. We're still working on the first presentation. Oh, this, this is the second presentation of three, I guess, that I'm doing in one. So the first was first was book bind book binding. Second is scan. Yes. Uh, Eric, have you come across uh, USDOT, FHWA, a lot of government? They three whole bunch, of them, but they also use industrial staples. Oh, okay. And so they'll be both three hole punch and staple. They're those big, heavy staples. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I've not encountered any of those. Mm -hmm. The closest thing were the HP Users Library Solutions, which are three hole punched and then stapled with regular staples. I'll be sending you some that I've okay. done that go clear back to the 60s with that wow. style that cover mm -hmm. 65 and stuff like okay. that. And then there's also, I have a bunch of, they're screw type posts. Mm -hmm. And what they do mm -hmm. is they're, they've got a head on one end, they're aluminum, and they're different lengths. Yeah. And then the other end just screws in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you can get your own cover that you want, get the yeah, proper depth of it, and you just screw yeah. it back in. And those are for those that are three old punched as well. Okay. So there's combinations out there that different variations of people might not have come across. Mm -hmm. and they help you when you undo them and do them back. Yeah. Back. So if you want that Martin Yale 7000E, I just check eBay and you can get one for $625. I paid a lot less than that. <laughs> I, I do need a new blade. I've, I've sharpened again and I think that they sharpened it past the maximum number of sharpenings. And a new blade is going to be close to $200, which is about what I paid for it 10 years ago. And then of course the last one is the hole punch. You have basically two sizes of little holes. Mm -hmm. Then they make the one that does the bigger hole. Mm -hmm. And on the three ring binders and various, they don't catch and tear as easy. Oh, okay. more room. So when I do ones that have the small, mm -hmm. I realign them and they're adjustable so you can make sure that they all line up oh, okay. for both depth and spacing across. And you can take the small hole, make it a little larger hole. Mm -hmm. okay. And then when you put it back in the binder, it pages turn a lot easier oh, yeah. than those little holes. It's a good thing you can and like Richard said, they got a good big arm on them, so when you do them, they get really a good shear on them. Mm -hmm. so my second. Before I oh, jump to skin, as Richard said, I'm really anal about it. I just want a lot of manuals. Like, I have manuals that nobody else has, and I was reluctant to send them to Eric, and we had all of this discussion <laughs> pretty much on the phone. And I just said, okay, I'll just like. Pray and send them, and I can tell you, except for the ones that had to be cut, which obviously you know have to be cut, I got them back into a casual observer. There's no difference, so don't let the fact that they have to be disassembled deter you from sharing stuff with Eric to add to the collection because you basically can't tell. So I can I can be uh, I'm as anal as anyone about that stuff, and they, they came back just fine. So I can I can support it. <laughs> And if you don't have that cutting machine, you can go to a lot of people that do professional printing. They got stable a machine. You know, they yeah, got a machine. Cutting. They'll cut it in. They'll ram press it down. That shear knife will come down. It'll cut it to within thousandths of an inch of where you want it cut. 
and the nice clean and the staples. Shoes. It's not something that shows up in the price list, so they do it for free. Oh wow! Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't know how to charge it. So Maybe that's what I should be doing instead. You have to pay stuff. thirty-four bucks to sharpen the blade. Yeah, you can get them cut really nice. Yeah. My my next talk in this multi-talk series is scanning books and the process to make a good quality scan afterwards. As I said before, I use a Fujitsu 7160 ADF scanner for 99% of my scanning. It's very fast, good quality. I've even scanned thousands of photographs with it because as most people say, again, ADF is not good enough for photographic prints. This one, combined with keeping it clean, gives you something good enough. Sure, it's not quite as sharp as a flatbed, but with a whole lot less effort. You can just stick in a stack of photos, hit scan, and zoom, 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 zoom. If you, have a flat, if you need a flatbed on something, a book that I can't put into the ADF or whatever, I have a, it's a Canon Wide 60, they don't make any more, it's probably 10 years old. It was well under $100 when it was new, so it's a cheap scanner, but it does a pretty good job, especially for the price. A much better job than some of the other scanners that cost several times as much as I found. They have similar models in the Wide series, I don't know if the current Canons are much different from this, but I've had good luck with it. The only disadvantage is that scanning area is limited to 8.5 by 11.7. And some of these things might be 8.6 inches wide or something, and then you're going to miss the edge of the page. So it would be nice to have a bigger flatbed, but the big flatbeds cost a lot more. Uh, one thing I've found is that with a lot of scanners, the reason people hate scanners or they stop being able to use their scanner is because the software, software included with it is terrible and only works with certain operating systems. And a solution I found that's a program called ViewScan. It had a $100 version that supports ADFs and a $40 version that does just single scan pages. And it just works really well. Every scanner I tried it with it works perfectly. They used to offer lifetime free updates too. They no longer do that. I think you get one year free updates now. Unfortunately, it's not quite the deal it used to be, but you at least still get updates for a year for free. And it's very configurable. It's not the prettiest software in the world, but it does everything I need. And I have no complaints about it. It, it. I found even it takes my cheap little $70 scanner or whatever and turns it into something that makes very good quality output for my needs. This is the interface of it, just an example of something I scanned on the flat. Um, no, this is the, the ADF. Some tricks for working with the scanner. One is you need it to be clean. You don't want to have dust that's going to interfere with your scan, so I use a soft lint-free cloth like what you would use for cleaning a camera lens. With a flatbed, wipe the whole flatbed. With the ADF scanner, you've got glass imaging surfaces. The ADF scan both sides of the page at once, so you have both sides you have to keep clean. I've also found sometimes the ADF rollers pick up ink from the pages, especially if it's like a poor quality ink, and then that ink gets transferred onto other pages, so I don't know the best way you're supposed to clean them. I've found isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, it cleans them up nicely. Eventually, you do need to replace those the rubber degrades, but I've not had any issues with mine. I've scanned tens and tens of thousands of pages. The other thing that's really important is make sure the page is as straight as possible. You can de-skew in software, and I even have software de-skewing turned on with the ADF, but it is a lossy process. It's, it's going to lose some data. It's going to be not as sharp afterwards, so you want to minimize de having to de-skew it. And the other thing, as we mentioned earlier, make sure the pages are not stuck together before they go in the ADF, or you'll miss the scans, or worse, have them have creases, or even worse, have something get torn. Yeah, and, and if you get the you miss a scan, then you get the odd even page number and screw it up and all. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. The good thing is if you if, if you miss one, one of it, usually you're missing two at a time, and then your unevens are okay. But yes, it, yeah, it, that's a possibility too. Uh, also, I found for folded pages, those that have a stapled binding or brochures or just like a three, three fold brochure, two fold, however many part brochure, or any paper that isn't flat, like if it's curled a little bit, has water damage, an ADF is going to have some distortion in the scan because an ADF has to have a big enough gap so they can handle different thicknesses of paper. So it's not pressing down the paper, so the paper won't be completely flat in there. And that gap, two millimeters or so between the sensors, can make this distortion. In those cases, I've found scan them manually with a flatbed. So in a lot of the Series E, the 30 Series calculators, those uh, little booklet things, I've been scanning with the flatbed because they have that crease right down the middle. It, yes, it takes me more time, but the results are better. ADF 
sure it saved time, but I, I don't like those creases that it chose. Another thing I found is the backing of your scanner, usually a flatbed, has different possible colors. Usually they're white and sometimes they're black. So a white background on it is going to make your scans look brighter because it kind of shows through the paper and provides a brighter background. And uh, It's got a few disadvantages. One is that it auto crop is not going to work as well. It's much harder for software to see the edge of the page. There's just less contrast. Another is that you're going to get bleed through from the back of the page. So if there's printing on the other side of the page, now you'll see that coming through in the front. And that is really a big problem, especially if you have especially if you have any continuous tone that you'll, you can't clean up easily with filters. The other thing is a black background, and that solves both those problems. My ADF has a black background, my Canon flatbed has a white background, but there's an easy solution to it. When an Amazon bought some 12 by 12 sheets of black piece of vinyl, I cut it for the flatbed to the right size of the flatbed and stuck it to the top of the flatbed. Now my flatbed has a back, black background instead of a white background. Yes? I haven't tested this and verified it, but back in the days when I was doing a lot of printing, mm -hmm. and I got to know the the owner of the shop, and mm -hmm. we, we talked technical stuff about printing, and he told me that uh, using a goldenrod backing sheet to prevent bleed through worked very well, huh. so okay. I don't know. And then that may be more true for black and white versus color, too, depending on the time. I'm not sure. Yeah. That's in interesting. I've never guessed goldenrod. And here's an example, you can, hopefully you can see it from where you are, maybe it's a little harder with the projector, but the left is a black background, white is a black, white background, you can see the printing in the back side, it vanishes on the other one. Yeah. And sure, the contrast isn't quite as good, but you can solve that with, by applying filters to the image afterwards. Uh, the settings that I use, I scan everything at 600 dpi. The reason I do that is if you scan at 300 dpi and then try to de-skew, you're going to have uh, too much of a loss of image quality. Don't try to de-skew a 300 dpi scan, it's going to give you bad results. 600 dpi, you can get away with it, especially because I downsample things to 400 dpi in the end anyway, but scan 600 dpi, especially if you're using de-skewing. Uh, color document, always scan 24-bit color. Well, I guess your scanner could support more, mine doesn't. Uh, for everything else, use 8-bit gray. Don't scan black and white. If you scan something in black and white, monochrome, again, you cannot de-skew. There's no way you can fix it exposure, it just, even if you want to render a, a black and white output final PDF, scan in grayscale because you can't do any processing with a black and white image. It's, you're stuck with whatever the scan would pick. So scan in grayscale for black and white, then you, if you do it high enough resolution, you can de-skew and adjust your exposure if things are too bright or too dark, and then you can convert to black and white afterwards to get a small file size. I do enable auto de-skew with the ADF, I don't in the flatbed. And I've found it gets it within 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees, which is pretty much good enough. But I do, I do like to manually adjust things to get them down within less than 0.2 degrees. If it's off by more than 0.2, I adjust. If it's within within 0.2, I it's not worth risking hurting the quality anymore. I don't do any automatic sharpening because when it is premature sharpening, it's hard to clean that up, and you end up with a worse quality result in the end after processing. I don't do automatic levels because I want every page to have the same brightness. So when I do a mass processing of the whole book, because I'm not doing each page individually, then I, I just pick a few pages at random. This is the exposure I want and set them to that. I don't do auto cropping either. Uh, manual crop is okay, but get some outside, get some gap around the edge of the page. The reason for that is auto crop is never perfect. Sometimes crops too much or too little. Too little is okay. Too much is a problem because you have to rescan. So I do the do not do auto cropping, and later I'll run a process that crops it. Yes. And now, as you're scanning, is each page a separate file yes. in your computer? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I have it save each page to a TIFF. You could ping would be nice, but the software it doesn't save as ping, and it would take more processing time. I think it would be a good idea because it saves a ping probably saves about twenty percent compared to a compressed TIFF. Because a compression ping is better than a compression TIFF. Yes. Speaking of auto crop, I often you know get. Uh, documents were scanned by amateurs have auto crop on, and every and they're in PDF, and every page is a different size. A different size yes, yes, that drives me nuts. Yeah, yeah. So oh, yeah. that's why I make sure every page is if it's eight and a half by eleven, it's fifty one hundred by sixty six hundred pixels, so they're all exactly eight and a half by eleven inches. <laughs> and when I do this, each book is going to be huge. We're talking about several gigabytes. Some books are over ten gigabytes. You need a lot of storage for this, Hello. but storage is cheap. So. Well, it isn't cheap the last year, thanks to COVID or whatever, yes. but it used to be very cheap. 
Here's an example of what I have coming out of the scanner. The left is uh, from the ADF, and you can see I don't auto crop, but I did set some manual cropping just outside the page boundaries. Yeah. And the second is from the flatbed where I scanned one of the, I think that was a 30 series applications book. Processing the scans. So I use Windows 10 with WSL, which is the Windows subsystem for Linux, and that has Ubuntu Linux 18.04 running inside it. I'm using a combination of Windows tools and Linux tools, because Linux tools are more likely to be open source, easily automatable. It, they're free as in beer, in other words, freely available, and free as in speech, open source. I guess that's Richard Stallman, I think, who had that, the, that terminology. My first step after I get those TIFF scans is I run it through ImageMagic. It, and I tell it to auto crop using 60% tolerance and I output to ping and that's my command line that I use. Then I can look at it, if anything was miscropped, I can go back and manually fix those. Then, depending on the book, is what my next step is. If there are two up, I have more steps to do to split the two pages. But if it's one page, then I can just go ahead and de So I'm gonna go through and talk about how we deal with two up, two up scans. So here's what they look like after doing the crop. And you can see it's very close to the edges. They're not completely square, but pretty close. You see the holes from the binding on the left one. We'll deal with that. So two up scans. If you have, if you have a two up, then you need to split the pages. But furthermore, if these two up pages were folded and stapled, they're not going to be in an order that you would expect. In the example back here, the the left page is page 50 and the right page is page 3. So you need to have a way of reordering all these scans in the right order. It would be tedious to do it by hand, so I have, I have a tool to do it. First what I do is I make sure every page is the same size. So I use free Windows version called XN View Classic to rescale the, resize the canvas size. Usually what I do is I take a small amount, like 50 pixels from either, every side to get rid of the inconsistencies in the edges and then resize to a fixed size in the white background. As I said, 5100 by 6600 is 8.5 by 11, 600 dpi. Measure the book, multiply by 600, that's the size you want to make them all the same size. And here are the settings I use in XMView to make that happen with one particular book. So now I have something that looks like this. You can see the edges, I've got a little bit of white where it was black before, and every page is the same size. The next step is I have to split split the book up and reorder the pages. And I came up with an Excel formula. It's crazy looking here, but this Excel formula will generate the commands I need to run for a book and give you one file for each page, all numbered in the right order for the pages. Bold putting that slide up there. Yes, yes. Did you get that? Write that down? <laughs> and if you don't need to reorder, if it's one, two, three, four on every scan, this it's a simpler formula right here. It's missing a comma. Yeah. <laughs> so here's an example of the spreadsheet, which is on your the spreadsheet's on your USB drive in the proceedings folder. So you can just use the spreadsheet. You can see I put all the settings on the left. I, I say the, the width and height of each page, width, the upper left corner of the left page, the upper left corner of the right page, the base file name, start page number, end page number, ping format, what folder the output to, these are the commands. Then I just take this, paste it into my console, and it runs all the commands and outputs the file set. Then I run that, and I get this as a result. So each page is separate. So that, that particular command is the one that was run on the image that you saw on the previous slide to produce these two files. For, for what it's worth, I used something very similar to that, except implemented with a shell script when I scanned the uh, HP 71 software IDS volume oh, three. Yes. That's 5,000 pages of code listing for Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be using a variation of this when I scan that. Well, not that, but similar ones. So, I've, so now I've got the files either in the out folder from the first step or the out three folder with the Excel output. So now what I do is I use XNView to look at each page with the grid display turned on to see if it needs to be de-skewed. If it's off by more than about 0.2 degrees, I eyeball it. You get pretty used to it every while. I can see it's like, oh, that's off by 0.4 degrees. That's off by 0.1 degrees. And then I just hit the button a few times and de-skew it. And I have to go through each page one by one. So this is kind of a manual process that takes some time, especially if it's a big page. It may take a few seconds to save each one, too. 
And as I'm going through, this is the first time I'm actually looking at the pages, at the scans. So now at this point I see if something is wrong with the page, now I can go back and rescan if necessary or whatever. Uh, I note how close the edge some things are so I know how much to crop off the edges. Uh, because sometimes you have to crop off more to deal with the perforation holes. So here's what the XMD looks like. It puts the grid on there and I can kind of easily see how much something needs to be de skewed. What was the program that you X, used? XN View Classic. It's a free. It's a free. It's X free for personal what use. View? Yeah, I've got a link at the end of the presentation. Okay. XN View. Oh, XN. I thought you said different view, which is one. Oh yeah, it's very similar, but that one I think isn't free. So this is what I have at this point. You can see the there's a li there's a little bit of you can see the edges are discolored from where I rotated it. And I'll deal with that later. So now I need to do the final cropping. So I figured out about how, much, about how much to crop from each page. And again, I was talking about this before, I figured out the final size. I went 5100 by 6600 for an 8.5 eight by 11. I found sometimes if you have uh, holes punched on one side, you cut off that much on that side. The other side, you can't cut off that much or you'll cut off printed materials. And the left side cropping needs to be different than the right side cropping. Mm -hmm. So before I do that, if that's the case, I wrote a quick little bash script that just moves all the file scans and the odd pages are in one folder, even pages are in the other folder, and I just do mm -hmm. odds and I just do evens. And it just looks like this. It makes a folder for evens, moves the evens over, makes a folder for odds, moves the odds over. And I'm, I, I, I can't remember if I wrote this to handle quotation handle weird spaces or anything, but it doesn't matter since I've never put spaces in my file names. I probably should have quotes around the dollar sign F's if you have spaces. I, I think all the pages I scan are odd. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're calculator material, I'm sure they are. So that's what I have now. You can see I, I before had the holes from the coil binding, and now those have been cropped off. And if you look really carefully, you can see that it's a little bit, the whiter area is a little bit whiter in one side than the other, maybe. <laughs> No, maybe not. I can't tell. Could you process the ship? Yes, yes. Or so would you? I, I can do that too with okay. the scripts, depending if necessary. So next step is to adjust the levels. So some people just do brightness and contrast. I've found that that isn't quite as powerful. Sometimes the levels will do a little better job of not distorting colors. And it help it's a little better if you use the level adjustment rather than brightness and contrast. Hmm. So I've found a few representative pages within the book to get some baseline settings and then you run that against the whole book. For grayscale images, I found set a black point of 120 and a white point of 210 with my particular scanner. It's going to be dependent on your book, your scanner, everything. Those have to be the settings that work for me. If you're scanning, you'll probably find different settings. That's grayscale for color. I don't do quite as much and I'll show you why I can't push the black up as much or the white down as much. So this is the original scan out of the scanner on the left. The one on the right is if I did 120-210, which is great for black and white stuff. But look what it does to colors. It makes your, your brownish orange turn to a more of a brighter yellowish orange. The shift keys are really overly vibrant. The blue becomes kind of dark. And if you look closely, if you were to zoom in, you'd see it gets like a light blue halo around it, which doesn't look good. So you maybe use a different setting. Somewhere in the middle gives you something that's a little bit brighter, but still natural. It's not affecting the quality of it. The problem is you still have to post-process it more to get it to look good in the end. And I'll get to that. This is just the levels adjustment in XNView, the tool I use. Again, you process a whole bunch of files at once. Here's a close-up of what it looks like before and after in black and white. So you can see there is kind of a, gray, a dark gray and a light gray, and the right it's black on white with appropriate, appropriate gray scale as necessary. And here's color. Again, you can see it's the background, you've lost the texture of the paper now, and your blacks are a little bit blacker, but it still needs some more work. So now we need to do manual cleanup of these pages, especially for the color stuff. I use a program called Paint.net. It's a free image manipulation program for Windows. I found it works very well. Unfortunately, it's not open source. It used to be, but when it was open source, what some people did is they compiled the open source code with their own name and tried to sell it, and the author got pretty mad about that, so he stopped making it open source a decade or so ago. So I have to open up each and every page. I look at them, see if there are any speckles that I need to erase off the pages. I found photographs tend to be really harmed by the level adjustment. So for those, I have to go back to the previous version before I adjusted the levels, copy that photograph, paste it back in, and manually adjust levels of contrast or whatever to make it look right. But pages with color, now I have an extra step. 
I'm uh, very picky about color versus grayscale. If a page has color, it's color, and, and the grayscale it needs to be grayscale. But if you scan grayscale and color, it's not perfect. You've got like chromatic aberration. See, there's a little bit of a orange chip in one, a little bit of a blue chip on the other. It's not actually grayscale. So I fix this because I want it perfect. So I mask off the areas so that I'm only highlight. You can see the light blue is the mask is the area I'm processing, and the not white light blue is the area I'm not processing. And here's the biggest complaint I have about Paint.net: it does not have a polygonal select tool. It only has square and circle and lasso and magic wand. So I use the lasso by drawing. Basically, I use a draw like that, and I draw like that, and I draw like that to get a triangle. It's a hassle, but for whatever reason, that's not been implemented. But anyway, you highlight what you need, and I turn the saturation all the way down on the grayscale part, so that loses the color information. It says two benefits. First of all, it looks a little better. You don't get a little bit, a little bit of a color glow on your grayscale. Second of all, it prints better because it, you don't aren't using up coloring when you're printing. And actually, there's a third benefit, and the file size tends to be smaller, too, because it's reduced the number of colors in your image. So once I've done that, now I now I using that same area that was selected the grayscale portion. I adjust the levels for the grayscale portion so that the blacks are a nice deep black. There'll be a different again. You have to figure out what levels you want, and then I invert the selections. The colors are selected. Here's another tool. I've not found a tool to let me bulk do the curves. Accent View doesn't let you bulk do curves, and Paint.net doesn't do bulk processing at all. But I come up with a curve, and this curve here is just showing from black to white. And unfortunately, it doesn't let you save the curve, so I've, it remembers the last use, but I've written down all the values that are common for different settings that I use. And this particular one, I've got points at 147, 147, 197, 197, 221, 226, 238, 255. What that does in the colored area is it makes the white, it's bumped, the near white, it's bumped up to white, while not affecting the color. So this gives you a perfectly white background without distorting your colors at all. So now the colored area is in a white background, and again, that reduces your file size and makes the file look, makes the scan look better. Uh, for the shaded areas where you have black text on a, on a shade, you kind of have to do the opposite. So here I have again found a curve 94, 0, 128, 83, 192, 192. That brings the blacks down to truly be black without affecting the colored shade area. So again, it improves contrast readability, reduces the file size slightly. Now these scans are finished. I've done all the processing, processing I need on each one of these pages. Now, in terms of the contract, which is always a problem. I just, like, no matter what I Anyway, um, in Word, they have a function of uh, a process photo or something mm -hmm. that's on the bottom of the menu. And you select that, and they have three sliding bars. And the top one is uh, sharpness. Okay. The bottom and the, and the next ones are, I don't know, brightness and darkness or something. And normally you would go to the brightness and darkness, uh, or if it's brightness and contrast or something. But the shading one works the best. You just move a little bit over. Oh man, it's just crisp. Yeah, yeah. There are different things. You, yeah, another thing you adjust is gamma too. That's another possible adjustment. There are a lot of different filters you can apply to manipulate these images. Some have auto auto leveling type things. Uh, I, I never do any sharpening. I found that sharpening is it doesn't really help. Oh, that they call it sharpening, right? But it it, it, might, it may be sharpening, it may not. It's, uh, sharpening so for me, I I don't need it for the process. I, I yeah. Okay. Because this, if you look at the the text, the black text on here, it's very sharp after going through this, these steps. We all want black, not gray text. Right. So after we've done this, I have these 600 DPI 24-bit color scans, which are, they look great, but they're overkill. They're making these giant files. So first of all, I downsampled them to 400 DPI, which I think is noticeably better than 300 DPI. It is twice the size, but it's noticeably better than 300 DPI. And there's really minimal benefit to be gained on most documents from 600 DPI. Mm. I've found for, for downsampling, uh, I use the bilinear filter on text and diagrams, and Lonzo works better for halftone photographs because it minimizes the aliasing that you get from halftones. But Lonzo on the on the text causes it's like a JPEG style ringing I've noticed, whereas bilinear doesn't. So 
use the right sampling algorithm for the type of material you're downsampling. I did discover X and V is a bug with the grayscale desampling. So if you want to downsample grayscale, first convert to 24 bit color, then downsample, then convert back to gray. I don't know why, but I guess there's a bug there. Uh, then what I do once I downscale the form of DPI, I reduce the color depth. For grayscale images, I go down to four bits per pixel, which is 16 colors. For color, I go down to eight bits per pixel, which is 256 colors. Mm. And I wrote a little tool in C Sharp, I call it Scan Image Optimizer, that uh, does this for me because both X and View and Image Magic do not do a very good job of, of downsampling to eight bits or lower. I don't like, first of all, grayscale tends to come back to get colors in there because it picks a color that's close to gray, and I don't like that. Second of all, sometimes they just pick colors that don't make sense to me. This tool I wrote, don't use it on photographs because it, it doesn't do a good job in photographs and it's very, very slow, especially if you have more than 50,000 colors. But for text, line art, that type of thing, that's what I, that's what I designed this program for. And that could be another whole talk that I'm not going to give today. It's about that tool and how it works. But what I do with that is I'll use Image Magic to reduce to 18 bit color first to reduce the number of colors so that it, the tool runs faster. Because 18 bit still looks good with Image Magic, but it saves a lot of time in the, in the processing of my tool. So this is what this is the process that we went through. We started with a 600 DPI 24-bit color TIFF that was 15 and a half megabytes with TIFF compression, which I think is LZW. Then I cropped it which, and saves a ping, which brought it down to nine and a half megs. Cleaned it up, which brought it down to 847K. So just by making the page from grayish to white and everything else, just reduced the number of colors, reduced the complexity of the image, cut our file size by 90 something percent. Then I downsampled the 400 DPI 8-bit color. Now we're 225 kilobytes. And it looks basically identical to this one, unless you zoom in and look really closely. And that file is ready to go. I use opt, opti ping, opti PNG, OPTI PNG, opti ping with the level seven, which is the best ping optimizer I've found. So now that I've got the ping file, I need to convert to a PDF. There's a free tool called Tesseract OCR. It was actually developed by HP back in the 80s. Is open source and has been continually developed since then. When they're now using it, it's like neural network or some kind of thing. I don't know. It, it's kind of funny. Some of the artifacts it generates, it adds random letters in places where I think it thinks they belong. But it's the, some of the best OCR I've seen. What, what's the file type of the PNG? To yeah, so I take the, take the ping file, and then what this tool does for a single ping, it outputs a PDF that has an invisible text layer on top of it for what the letters are OCR it has which means you can now copy and paste from it, search it, whatever. And again, I found there's a bug in version 4.1.1 that massively increases the file size with pings, so I'm using a custom build like based on 4.0.0 beta 4, and then I patched out the bug until they release a version with the bug fixed. So that works best for me, but it's just a custom build I had to make. Only runs under Linux? You might run under Windows, but I just do, I use WSL, so I have Linux in Windows. And that's the syntax. It's, it's simple to do one file, but to involve, I have to do a for loop to iterate through each of the, each of the files. How much longer? Uh, we're uh, mostly done on 86, and there are about 107, I think. Next up, I have to combine, to combine them together. PDF Unite is in the popular PDF library. Very simple syntax. PDF Unite start PDF to the output file. Next step is I want to table of contents on each of mine. And most, most of these books have a table of contents. I want it to be linkable so that the user can see the table of contents on the left, left, click it, jumps that page. It'd be way too much work to do it by hand with a tool like Acrobat or something. So I've found a program called JPDF Tweak. It's a command line program. It takes a semicolon separated values file to load the table of contents into the PDF. The way I generate that is with that command there, it needs Java, and I'm ex extending the memory usage of Java to make it work with a big file. But you just copy and paste that and change the things to make it work. Now, how do I get that semicolon separate values file? I've got an Excel spreadsheet. These Excel is one of the greatest tools ever. You can do anything with Excel. So with this spreadsheet, again, this is in your conference proceedings in the folder for my, my talk. First, I have the names of the sections, and I just pulled that out of the OCR table of contents and just copy and pasting it in. With a little cleanup here and there to, to fix the OCR errors. Page numbers, 
which sometimes the OCR gets right, sometimes it gets wrong, and you have to fix that. The depth, which is if you're at level one, level two, how deep into your hierarchy you are. And then it outputs the semicolon separated value that I just copy into a document and use that as my input to generate the table of contents of the PDF. And once I've done that, I use a tool called EXIF tool. It's another free Linux command line program that just sets the metadata on the file. Normally, producer is the name of the, soft, the brand of software, like it may say Adobe Acrobat or something like that, and I just put hpcalc.org. The creator tool, I put there, I credit the name of the person who scanned it, which is generally hpcalc.org, but if the scan came from someone else, I, like Valentino Leo, I credit them instead. Creation date, modification date, which the date was made. And the author, so that'd be Hewlett Packard, and most of these, and then the title, which is the title of the book. So that's all just stored metadata in the PDF. So now we're done. The example I've been showing a lot of this time, it was 2.8 gigabytes of raw color scans have now resulted in a 68.7 megabyte PDF. Still pretty big. It's still big, but nowadays, 70 megs, yeah. really not a problem anymore. So here's, here's what the output looks like. You can see the table of contents on the left. I've got side-by-side -side page view, which I, I use a Foxit reader. It's an old version from like 10 years ago, but it's, it's not bloated, it's fast. There's a, uh, there are a few others. There's uh, Sumatra PDF, which is good as long as you have version 3.4. The previous versions are more limited. You can use Adobe, but it's just slow and bloated, so I don't. It's expensive. And yeah, the, convert, the full, not the reader, but yeah, the Adobe Acrobat is expensive too, and I don't want to pay for it. I'm using free software. Mm -hmm. So now my final, final talk which I'm only going to maybe do about half a talk on because I don't have that much time. I don't know how long it's been, but I'm running out of time. Is what have I done with this? Well, so I had the idea for a literature archive site back in 2008. I was talking to HP and they were, they had some ideas for some big improvements they wanted in my website and they, they actually helped with some of it. And some of those ideas I've since, since implemented, some I abandoned, some I put on hold until now. And one of the things we talked about was having me host all the HP manuals. And finally, I got around to it summer 2020 when I couldn't really go out and do anything fun. So I started on this project, and I did a soft launch at H HPCC last fall, but I didn't really publicly announce it because I wasn't far enough along yet. This is the website, literature.hpcalc.org. It has everything I've scanned, everything I've processed, and all the HP stuff. My original plan, which I had pretty much done by the last conference, was to just host all of HP's website's PDFs, which they don't necessarily have now, because with HP's website, things disappear and reappear, and you come one day, you'll find another, another day will be gone, but I've been saving them over the years. So I collected everything I'd saved, and then I cleaned, I cleaned up scans that other people had done on some manuals, and then I had scans of a few of the books that I have, but I don't have that many, and my plan was to borrow a dozen or so books from other people, things that I thought needed good scans that hadn't been done yet. That was my original goal, and it was well underway by the HPCC 2020. I reached pretty much that point in February of 2021. That's a typo. I should say 2021. Uh, I reached that February of this year, but still needed to borrow some books. So I was talking to Richard, like, can I borrow these books from you? Well, in March, when I was going to borrow these books, I wanted to borrow the 95C manual specifically and a few others because there's no good scan of that. He's one of the few people who even has that. <coughs> And it turned out I timed things very well because he was in the process of divesting himself of his entire HP collection and had not gotten rid of it yet and had not made a contract to get rid of it either. So he agreed to send me one copy of each of the books I needed, even though he sold them to someone, he was selling them to someone else. Then after I scanned them, going to sell yes. them. Hadn't he hadn't yet the sold them <laughs> once he'd reached the deal, then the part of the agreement would be one copy would go to me, <coughs> I would scan them potentially destructively, and then pass them on, and then he would resell them on eBay. So that gave me the opportunity to scan more than 500 books. This is hundreds of pounds of books. So he's been periodically <laughs> sending me boxes since March, and if not for him, this project would have been really done in February, and we would have had a much smaller, much smaller result. But you forgot to mention that for about a week, we spent two to three hours on the phone every going day. over every book yes. and every shelf. Oh, Identify oh, everything. Yeah, oh, this is revision B. Oh, this, I got now revision C. Mm -hmm. So we get the latest revision of the HP manual. It was, it it was, was a lot of work. And how he's got this giant 
board in this house that's all the piles of stuff yeah. that's to me. 11 piles of a foot high. Um, so, and then I shipped a bunch and then the box. So, so, yeah, the, well, the, fir the first shipment, the box was not strong enough and two books disappeared. Thankfully, there were extra copies of them. Yes, I'm, re well, I'm reminded <laughs> that David eventually will share the two. Oh, those are two Dave, good Dave is one of the few people on the planet who have a complete 40 set. <laughs> of the 6797 Seditions yes. books. Right. There are two that Richard did not have because he gave his only, only copy to use. So at some point I will want to borrow them and non-destructively scan them. We'll swap what I lent you for yeah. manuals. <laughs> yeah, but not yet because I still have hundreds of books of his to scan. So yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll scan them myself. Yeah, right. and, and, and with regards to doing this, um, if, you, if you really look at what's all involved and what the costs are involved, uh, the Postal Service have, has a mail rate which they call media mail. Yep. And it's much, much cheaper. I mean, you get a 50 pound box to ship, and if, if you didn't have that media mail, it, you would break your for sure. So that's uh, that's a big help in moving all this material around. So back, back to this project, my plan completely changed. Now I have a new plan. One is to make a master list of all known HP calculator books and manuals, and the other part is scan as many of these as possible. So as Felix presented remotely this morning, unfortunately he can't be here, but as he presented to us, he has been maintaining a literature list of 5,169 items. Mm -hmm. But he is actually, I'm, we're not really overlapping here, because he is specifically not including manuals. Mine is primarily manuals. And I also have third-party software and books specifically related to HP calculators. He's doing other calculators. So in the end, I have 2,154 books. Actually, I think it might even increase since I did, it might be a few more than that now. But only about 200 of those overlap with Felix's list. So That's amazing. We're, yeah. <laughs> we were both working on lists of calculator stuff, and they're almost totally different. And for every single one of these, I'm recording when I know, can get it, the part number or ISBN, publish date, edition, the number of pages, which even if I don't have a scan of, a scan of these, I think that just having this bibliography, much oh, like Felix's is Making is your easy. master list, that was a mind-boggling project in itself. Yeah, and, and to make this list... <laughs> Uh, it really came from a lot of sources. First of all, I looked at all known digital copies of manuals, things scanned by other people. Then I looked through the HP catalogs for references to part numbers of other manuals. Then, thanks to Jake with his scans of the EDUCAL catalog and his index of it, which was even more important, then I was able to identify the more materials and calculator, uh, calculator manuals and stuff like that. There's a website, calcuseum.com, that has over 32,000 calculator-related items listed on it, hardware, manuals, that kind of thing. That taught me some more <coughs> items. And I cross-referenced Felix's list as well, and I found maybe 100 more or so from his list that I didn't have. Plus, I've had conversations with the various collectors, Richard, Bob Rasperi, Valentin Alvio, Franz de Vries, others who have collected a massive amount of material or been involved in the community long enough to know about things that I didn't know about that let me add this list. So I, I, as I said, I, start, I started with things from my original plan and then I've started go, now I've started going through Richard Nelson's collection to add more. I then had emails back and forth with Cyril de Brevesson and Tim Westman about some HP manuals that I suspected existed. I'd never seen it, but I believe that they existed. <coughs> And after enough emails, uh, Cyril in particular was able to come up with hundreds of additional unreleased, to our knowledge, PDFs. Oh, really? Oh, wow. some of the, these aren't old, these, you probably won't like them. They're just new calculators like the Kinfo era stuff. But from the last 10, 15 years, PDFs of different multi-language things that had not really been released. I think there was a later, maybe even a later edition of the 12C manual that hadn't been released, some things like that. So I've added all that in. Yes? Uh, I noticed a book through your site, and I noticed your manuals are all for basically the handles. Yes. You don't see that all thing from like the 9800 series. Right, so I that's true. And I'm thinking maybe a second, a later phase of the project could be that. But yeah, if I expand the project too much, it'll never get finished. <laughs> so I want to at least I want to at least finish this phase of the project before I take on yeah. more endeavors. Well, I'm saying I've, I've got some scanners, and I think I've got a Best Buy, and 
process looks pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really the key is you get 600 DPI scans and we can work with it. But yeah, Bob yeah, Kasperi has, has dozens more scans that he wants me to do. So uh, once I get through Richard's things, it's still, it's still a lot of material I have left to scan. So presently I have 1,179 books to download. That has 80,000, over 80,000 pages, 518 books of original PDFs from HP. Almost 7,000 pages, 24 books of scanned PDFs that HP had had on their website. 34,000 pages and 351 books of PDFs scanned by me personally, mostly in the last six months. Almost 9,000 pages of original PDFs created by the community. Another 31,000 pages, 225 books scanned by other people in the community, community that I then cleaned up. For a total of currently 161,312 pages in this collection. Uh, I, some things I discovered, first of all, I've been impressed at how many of the books I've encountered actually thank Richard Nelson for his help or inspiration, whatever. I, I hadn't really realized since I didn't come into the community until the last well, less than 25 years just how influential, how much of a leader he was in the calculator community in the 80s. Mm. Really impressed by that. Another thing, kind of trivia here. I think the print quality of HP manuals reached a pinnacle around the HP 7175 era. Mm -hmm. And even if I scan 600 DPI, I'm still not getting all the detail in them. The ink is so sharp, the color, colors are so so bright, it, it, good registration, it's just very well done. Before that era, era, the books tended to be sharp, but they were pasted up by hand, and sometimes things were misaligned, all that, lines were hand drawn, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. After that, they tend to use lower paper quality, lower print oh, quality. I, I might not explain that. Okay. Uh, when I was working with HP to do the card in the box, mm -hmm. the agreement was that I would pay for the printing. Mm -hmm. I would write it, they would approve it, and then as they printed them, I would they'd, they'd say, hello, we're running out of manuals, okay, I'll send you some more money. And, and they had them locally printed in Corvallis, mm -hmm. but when they left Corvallis, the, the whole uh, Thing changed. I said, that might explain. Yeah, they didn't have the same quality standards then, I guess. Well, they went to different printers. Right, and, right. Know. One thing kind of interesting is I found some of the early 90s books, like the 48 GX manuals, were computer generated and they're sharp, but you can tell they were only rendered at 300 DPI. So if you scan them at a really high resolution, you can see the, the lower resolution of the original document. Newer ones, the newer manuals, especially from the last 20 years, have such a poor quality printing process that even scanning at 300 DPI doesn't. It is in some ways overkill. So, but I found 400 DPI grayscale is enough to make barcodes readable. I know that's been a problem with scans in the past, that barcodes aren't yeah. necessarily readable. Here's a little bit of trivia here on the one particular thing. The manual was printed, the barcodes, on red paper. I'm assuming that was for a, term, a form of copy protection yeah, to minimize my photocopy. confirmed it was, yeah. But uh, the thing is, it doesn't protect it at all. Because no, you scan no, no, no. it and you just take the red channel out, you've got a pretty good quality yeah. image already. Scanning, adjusted scanning levels. in 1980 was very different. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this provided pretty yeah. good protection 40 years ago, but yeah. it's even, it's oh, now, now it's useless. Let me comment on that. Okay. Could read it, but when HP was copy. developing uh, the barcode system, mm -hmm. and this was a wonderful idea because now a program could be reproduced at very low cost, mm -hmm. they sent me prototypes of the scanning system. <clears throat> now at that time, BPC had a, uh, a, a, a copier, but it wasn't a Xerox copier, which is majority of what people use. Mm -hmm. It was a totally different uh, uh, approach to it. And I just took their their black on red sheets and ran them through there, and I got <laughs> uh, that over here. <laughs> and I sent them back to HP, and they were just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> How'd you do that? So they, uh, uh, I guess they they weren't going to eliminate the program. Thank mm -hmm. goodness, uh, but uh, the, the original concept was to provide security by black, mm -hmm. black and red because the red would blend in and would would be readable. Right. And the other thing regarding barcode is that uh, their barcode takes the width of the page, and of course PPC, you know. It's, we were cramming as much information on a page as possible. I did a lot of experimenting and testing that, uh, you know, you look at the barcode and the PPC ROM, and in fact it actually scans because you're not, you, you, you know, you, the longer you go, the more chances you've got of error, and it actually scans better and faster. Yeah, they're not in the stack of the original design, but they work just fine, right? 
Yeah, oh yeah. What, what one can conceptually imagine in, in, the, in the nature of one hand not knowing what the other's doing. <laughs> There's a team of people inside HP that went to a lot of effort to invent some software distribution means which would be super easy and cheap to reproduce. And then another team whose job it was to take that and make it really difficult and expensive to reproduce. <laughs> uh, another thing, this could be this slide here could be another whole talk. And I scanned a bunch of Jim Donnelly's books. He unfortunately isn't able to come to this conference, but he donated a bunch of them to me to scan. And one of his was a simulator of the Babbage Difference Engine Number Two. Yes, yes. And it had this was written back in the early '90s, so it had software for the 48 and for DOS. And first of all, the 48 is kind of been replaced by the 4950, and second of all, DOS, who has DOS anymore unless you have a DOS box. So I translated the system RPL program for the 48 to the 4950, which I think it could be a useful thing to talk about how you port from the 48 to 4950. And it was actually fairly easy to translate. Then the other one, the DOS program, the Win32 was harder because it had a number of x86 system calls. So I was inspired by when AIM48 was ported to Android the developer of that made a very thin Win32 translation layer to translate Win32 calls to Android calls. So I thought, well, what if I make a very thin layer to translate x86 system calls to Win32 calls? And that's what I, I wrote, a very thin translation thing. So it's using the DOS, original DOS code, very minimal changes, builds it in Win32 and runs on Windows 64, but Windows cool. just fine. Question? Yes. Uh, going back a couple of slides, uh, I was wondering what 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 come down down scaling from from uh, 600 down to 400 dots per inch? Mm -hmm. What what does that buy you in the in the process of converting to PDF? It approximately cuts the file size in half, so you're saving about half off the file size by going from 600 DPI to 400 DPI. And for most materials, the but the PDF doesn't the PDF. Further degree? No. So by using Tesseract OCR, I have it so that it retains the original images, does not re-encode anything. So a PDF file supports multiple image formats built in. One is ping, one is JPEG, it supports JPEG 2000, it supports CCI TT, something like that. It's like an old fax machine, lost. it's a lossy black and white format. It might support uncompressed as well, I'm not sure, but there are multiple formats that PDF in natively supports with any reader. Ping is one of them. So I make a ping file. My ping files are put unchanged in the PDF. And that was actually there was that bug I was talking about in Tesseract that after a certain version of it, 4.0 something, it tries to re-encode that ping, even though it doesn't need to, and that reduces increases the file size significantly. And so those G3 and G4 fax formats are, are actually they're actually lossless. Okay. Well, Maybe they're, they're lossless, but trying to convert them to a TIFF ends up being lossy because it's not like a, it's not a fixed grid, not a square, not square pixels no, or something yeah. like that. Well, so, we can talk about well yeah, all, all I know is there are some that I, it looks like there's been lossy compression. Maybe that's, maybe it's a different format that confused them. Because I know there are multiple forms. So, okay, that's, that's good to know that that one is well, Of course, we, we talked over dinner the other night about, about JPEG being mm -hmm. terrible for text yeah. and line art, but it is, it is, it is lossy and was designed for photographs. Right, right. right. Unfortunately, that's the default format that a lot of you know, consumer grade scanner software uses. And so people provide rare documents that they've scanned and they don't know how to set their scanner software to something else. And, and when you look at them, the lines and text get blurry because of that. So right. right. Have you, when you say you're missing the Ted Kerber stuff? Yes. Is that, uh, you, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a bunch of it to send to you and I've sent you some. Yes. Is that, uh, in addition to, um, uh, to my, uh, you, uh, you have not told me that you have these ones that are missing. Oh, so if you're still okay. sending me, I don't know about it. Oh, okay. So anyway, so I was able to scan the 95C owner's handbook, thanks to Richard, but I've not been able to find the 95C applications book. It's did probably you, one of the rarest books ever. Well, I had yeah. three, three pairs, the manual and the applications. So that was six books. And then I only had one additional manual, no application. Well, when I sold them... Two? Well, I don't remember. See, that's the problem. Um, I know Matthias has a pair. Huh? Okay, He's so if pair. we can get him to oh, scan yeah. it or something. He can loan the applications book, that'd be great. Yeah. It, that's, that's a stretch, but I'll try. Yeah. Well, or even, <laughs> if you can just take pictures of the pages or something, just so we can have a copy. There's no electronic copy that, of that. It's ironic that he has a set because 
He doesn't do manuals. <laughs> but that one he'll do. And some other books I've not been able to find any copies of. The 75 User's Library Solutions Graphics and Real Estate. No one's ever scanned. And as I said, so Ted, as Richard was saying, Ted Kerber made 40-some surveying applications books for a bunch of calculators. I'm missing over three quarters of them. I've been trying to contact them. The phone number listed for, for design. When I call up my phone, my phone says design. So it's still in the database being designed, but I get no answer. So I don't, I don't know. I think she probably, if she has them. I'm guessing she has them. I just need to get in touch with her somehow. The other thing that I have a huge gap is non-English language manuals. Most, nearly everything I have is English because that's where I can get the lists more easily. And I'm sure there are a lot of foreign language things I don't even know about. Now, those two 75 books, I haven't been able to find in years, and much more tellingly, Sylvain has never been able to find. So maybe they never maybe existed. Maybe they were never produced. Yeah, they, they're listings and part numbers for them, yeah. but yeah, that's possible. So what are my next steps? First is to finish scanning the books from Richard. We have about 250, I think, at least to go including some he hasn't sent to me, so there are probably more than that I don't know about. But I, I now have a method to do that, okay. which took so, a lot of testing. <laughs> so. And 55 of those are ones that are already scanned by others that I have on my website, but I'm going to make a better quality scan. Yes? So the Museum of HP Calculators, Dave Hicks, sorry, he's, he's got the 95C application book on that. Really? In his, uh, the, okay, the, I, didn't, I, I didn't know that. Interesting. Okay. Who was that? Dave Hicks from HP, HP really? Museum website. Oh, on the website? Yeah. Oh. But, I mean, the manual isn't available for download on the website. It's part of this, this collection. This okay. CD set. Interesting. Well, I'd like to make one that's a good quality scan if possible, yeah, yeah, really available. Yeah. And I'm guessing it'll probably take me another six months to get through those books. Unfortunately, I've been spending way too much time up until like 2 a.m. every day for the last six months I'm scanning, and scanning, and scanning. <laughs> and I'm getting a little tired, but mm -hmm. I'm most of the way done. I still need to scan items promised me by Bob and Franz Debris. Then the next step is there are about 160 books that I have scans that have done by other people in the community. Some here in this room have sent me scans that they've done. I need to resume cleaning those up and adding them to my website if I can't scan them myself. And simultaneously then I will be asking the community for more things to send me to fill out my, my missing items. If you don't want me to cut bindings that are perfect, I won't cut them. It just takes me longer to scan, so it's easier if I can remove the binding. And uh, currently, there are over 600 books I know about that I have not found a scan for. Now, those scans may exist, as Eric pointed out. I totally missed some of these scans, I guess. But I just don't know about them. But you've got a list of what, of what yes. is known, and they can check your list right. easily. You know? So this is what the website looks like. It's got the list of all the uh, manuals. I've got different information about each one. You can sort them. You can filter them. And then you click on each one. It shows the information about it for ones that I've scanned. I've got what the cover looks like and more details about each one of these on here. This is on your USB drive, and it's also live online on literature.hpcalc.org. I'm thinking based on time, I cannot demonstrate this anymore unless there is time. I don't know. I'm, I'm over my time. Not quite on one. Okay. So th these are URLs for the various programs to download. And let me... How do I do this? <laughs> okay. Here's the USB drive. We go to, let's browse the drive, which of course opened on the other monitor. And literature is, we scroll down, we've got it right here, which brings up this. This is the website as you see it. And I've got <coughs> these manuals here. We can, we can filter it, let's just say filter by English. He's probably recommending oh, English. English. Uh, oh, he's using Chrome. One thing I forgot to mention, Chrome is really slow at filtering. Firefox is immediate. I don't know why, because everyone says Chrome's faster than Firefox, but mm -hmm. I've found, for whatever reason, I don't, I'm not very good at JavaScript, and whatever JavaScript I've hacked together, Chrome doesn't like. So, all right, we're using Chrome. So if I, if I pick, pick one of these books, I don't know which ones I've done. There's some good ones there. Now let's pick 41. Um, 41 Users Library Solutions. These are some ones I recently scanned. You click on one of these, and it shows you. Here's the here's the whole thing. I should have the contents of the web, so you can just pick one that jumps to that page. Then we can also do this. This is the list of all the ones that we have scans for. But if you go to the full master list here. This is the entire list 
of all 2,160 books that I know of. So actually, this is higher than when I made the presentation. And I've got it so you can, it can fit on your screen. I run on a 4K screen, which makes it much easier to see everything. But on a smaller screen like this, you might want to turn off a few of these columns so you can more easily fit it in one page. Oh, so, uh, you want all languages? And yeah, it's show, showing all languages. If I have it, it's blue, and you can click on it. If I don't, it's black and white. Uh, you can check last update, and that shows me shows me when I added to the site, so you can tell what's new. You click up here, and it's going to sort. Click again, and there we go. My most recent change on this was just the day before yesterday when I added this one here. Just, just not having crap around the edges is very nice. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a look like look like you're looking at the original document, and, and I think in Chrome, I know you can do this in Firefox, but I think in Chrome you can say the page view to be yeah two page. Oh, but it, okay, cover page separately. There you go. So now you get to see it like you're reading a book, the left and right pages next to each other. It doesn't smell like a book. It doesn't smell like a book. They make a candle for that. <laughs> <laughs> Old deuce print. <laughs> Opera. And you can ex export this to Excel, or copy and paste this into Excel if you want to manipulate it, print it, whatever. But this is my master list of all Have you tested literature. Uh, Opera? No, I haven't. I think it might be Chrome based now. I'm not sure. No, no, oh, it no. isn't? Okay. Now, Edge is now Chrome based. I, know that. I think Opera uses. Um, the same rendering engine that Apple, an old version, a fork of what Apple uses. Oh, because Apple's also, isn't, well, Apple's web, is WebKit-based, web -based. which is what Chrome is based, so they're, they're Long ago, yeah. Yeah, they, they're really all related somehow. Which all came from, I think, Conqueror, originally, on Linux. Wow. Anybody, I haven't any, thought of that in a long time. Anybody now. here use Opera for their browser? I do. Who? Yeah. Yeah. They seem to have a problem for since the last couple of updates. My yeah, I, I, I use it because, it because uh, I think I got a uh, virus or what have you that really screwed up all my browsers. And if you can't get on the internet, how do you straighten things out? And Opera was not touched, and that saved my, my, my whole system, you know. While we're talking browsers, does anybody else in here use Brave as a browser? It's Chromium compatible, it's much faster. Any, any final questions for Aaron? I, I won't question yes. Eric. Uh, I recently had to download X and View onto a, a Windows X10 machine, and I ended up with the window of X and View MP. Yeah, that's the new version that's not. I, don't, I think it's, it's still in beta or something. And it's, maybe, yeah. Uh, there's, there's some differences on that because I was going to ask yeah. classic as it says. I have that? both on my computer. I play with both, and I prefer the original one. Okay. But I'm sure at some point MP will take over. Both are being maintained still. Okay. And I was uh, doing new things on MP that I could probably do in a classic but didn't know how. Yeah, so. that's possible. Yeah. Would it help to have some of us do some of the, the raw scanning? Or yeah. It, other. Yes. Yeah, so it went at some point when I'm ready to start processing other people's scans. I'm going to put some guidelines for that. Because right now, I'm busy enough just doing what I'm doing. But <laughs> if others are doing scans, to me, the best is scan 600 DPI, TIFF, and either 24-bit color or 8-bit grayscale. And then you're going to have these many gigabyte files. You, you either get to me by some kind of file sharing or on USB drive or something mm -hmm. that I can process. Do you think if, if you just the list of titles on the current site yeah, is yeah. super valuable, yeah. <laughs> look at everything you have. If it's yeah. not on there, put it aside and then later. And some of the ones that are not on there are ones I'm pending scanning. Actually, if you click on each one, I didn't demonstrate this, but some of them say if you click on it, it says it, it's I'll not here, it but tomorrow. it'll say it's on hp41.org or on HP Museum USB drive collection or on hpmuseum.net or some may say pending scanning, I, I, or it says I have book pending scanning, or book has been promised to me pending scanning. So if you click on each one, it'll tell you sort of the those details. Time. Now, I don't have those links active on the version on the USB drive, but on the live website it has that, because that's more time, it's going to change over time. So I didn't want to put this book is pending scanning on the USB drive. All right, let's take a 10 minute break. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.